when you come to a different format, you have to be able to adapt. Hello, everybody. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 380. Today, I'm joined by Mr. Adrian Paul. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for this show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick. I'm the guy who said, you know what? I'm just going to do it. I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump in with both feet and make martial arts my life. It's what I do. It's my job. It's, it's kind of several jobs. And one of those jobs is whistlekick.com. And you can check out all the things that we make over at whistlekick.com, including apparel and uniforms and training gear and so much more. And if you're interested in purchasing something, use the code PODCAST15. Saves you 15%. Let's us know you listen to the show. Man, if only we could do this show entirely in video. We do have a few video episodes. You can find those at our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash whistlekick. Now, the show notes, everything we've got going on with this podcast are, is at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We drop two episodes a week for you. They're always free. We don't ever make you pay to get access to old episodes like some shows do. Just we give you the whole thing because, well, we want you to enjoy it. And I think you'll enjoy today's episode. My guest, as I said, Mr. Adrian Paul, who you may know from the Highlander series. You may know him from a variety of movies, television. You may know him from the Sword Experience events. There's a lot of stuff he's got going on. He talks about a ton of it, gives us some stories, some insight. And through it all, we learn a lot about his perspective on martial arts. And I think you're going to come away with some pretty good stuff. So let's get into it. Mr. Paul, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much. Very nice to be here. It's nice to have you here. You know, I'm, I'm digitally. So digitally, yes. Yeah, it, it's it is amazing with technology that the the types of the the new types of relationships that people can have. I mean, I have friends, people I would consider great friends, who I've never met. That's kind of sad, actually. Is it is it sad or is it is it is it creating another option? I mean, people that live, you know, far, far away doesn't mean I don't want to meet them. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's, it's but it's sad that we now have to w- uh, work digitally rather than meet somebody. Because I think the human experience is about, you know, the, the interaction that you have with somebody, you know, and I think it's face to face a lot of the time that's, uh, that's missing. You know, kids today spend a lot of time on, uh, on uh, Game Boys and, and, uh, you know, a lot of uh, phone and iPads and things of that nature, which sure. is good. It's not a bad thing, but I think you have to balance it with the, the face-to-face human interaction because it actually does work on the motor skills. I absolutely agree. And I, I think that, you know, when we look at the world, um, you know, just, just the martial arts world, right. it doesn't take much more than a surface examination to see how important those relationships become, whether it's instructor-student or the peer relationships within a training hall, you know, they're all so critical, not just to just enjoying training, but I think they're necessary in almost every case towards the advancement of skills. Well, you, you can't, I mean, uh, on the stuff we're doing at the moment, we, you know, it's, you can do certain things digitally. You can do a lot of videos out and that works, that works fine. But there is something about being in the room and seeing the slight nuances people do in a movement or, you know, somebody's hand could be in one position that you can't quite see on a on a online uh and that can be the change between the pressure you apply or the or the um movement that that uh, you allow in in weapons for instance so it's it's i think you know being in the space uh has a lot of value it has a lot of stuff that you can't really get online yet right right and i think if it was if all we needed was videos, and this is, this is not to, to discourage anyone from using videos as part of their training or, or anyone from putting out videos to educate others. If all we needed was videos, then martial arts classes could be reduced to someone demonstrating and everyone else copying. But certainly that's not what happens. Well, that's what, that's what all the online gaming is about, isn't it? <laughs> You're rehearsing online. You're not rehearsing in reality. In a sense, yeah. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Exactly that. If you if you went out if you went out onto the street and tried doing those same things on the street that you do online, they might not work. 
In fact, they probably wouldn't work. <laughs> I'm safe like, to, to cover my bases, but you know, it's... I, I don't mind being a little more inflammatory. It's, it's, it's my show. I'm used to catching the hate for it. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I think, you know, the, um, that, you know, online, online training is invaluable because sometimes you want to work with a teacher and you want to see what a teacher does. I mean, I've, I've, I, I am constantly online looking at different sword and martial art, uh, uh things before, uh, uh, my, my business, the sword experience to see things that, you know, we might want to uh, cover or, or fights we want to, uh, uh, address. And so it's, um, it's very useful to have that type of thing, but I think once you get into the room, it's another it's another level of uh, of training. Absolutely. Now you've mentioned sword a couple times, and this might be a good opportunity to have you tell tell the listeners a bit about how you got started in martial arts because your journey is going to be a little, from my understanding of it, a little bit atypical from the guests we usually have on. Well, I, you know, I started, I mean, I didn't start as a martial artist, um, as a, as a young boy, I was always getting into fights and, and, you know, in England, you know, martial arts, when I was a kid, weren't really, you know, everybody's, you know, everybody watching everybody, you know, Bruce Lee was just coming out, you know, he was, it was the time of enter the dragon and that and everybody's beginning to watch it and things. And, you know, obviously we wanted to know more about this stuff. And actually I, I spoke to a stunt coordinator one time. Uh, on Highlander, and he said, "You know, we heard about this martial arts coming in. And then we're talking about the '70s, '60s, '70s times." And he said, "You know, we heard about it. But we we didn't pay any notice to it. You know, we go in for a fight. We're going to smack them as hard as we can. You know." And then we saw, and we started working with some of these guys, and we were like, "Oh my gosh, this is something very different." And since that time, it's evolved in the past 30, 40 years. It's evolved immensely from you know knowing all the the different forms that are out there to the current MMA. Uh, type of fighting, which is, you know, the mixed martial arts has now taken it to a different level. So I think, you know, it's evolved immensely. So as a kid, when I started, uh, I started mine, I started doing uh, kicking, uh, kickboxing, taekwondo type of thing with private trainers and in the gyms and things of that nature. And then, you know, when I, I got Highlander, I really, I really immersed myself into the martial art culture um, uh, and with weapons and with open hands, uh, because I had to do it on the show, and I, I don't like doing things I'm not, I'm not capable of doing or showing uh, on screen. Because you know, I think, and this is what I what I teach people today is the fact that if you want to be on screen and be a swordsman on screen or a martial artist on screen, you have to know the basics. You have to know because otherwise, you're really not going to be um, able to do a long take of any any nature. Because all the people look at it and go, well, you, don't, you don't really move correctly. You're not, that, that, doesn't, that wouldn't work, and you're not doing this. So I think you really have to know the basics first or the fundamentals of anything uh, to, to make yourself look good at all. So when I started, you know, I said, you know, I'm, I started Highland. I was taught of sword work. Uh, I really learned the uh, European uh, epee and fencing uh, guards and styles from uh, Bob Anderson, who was uh, the fight choreographer for Prince's Bride and Star Wars and First Night and Highlander and et cetera, et cetera. He, his list went on and on and on. And I learned that. But after the first season, I went and really studied martial arts. Um, and I really started studying, you know, literally every day. Um, in between time, when I was on set, I was, you know, I was, and it, if you look at my performance as I went through it, I was, getting better and better and better as a martial artist and as a, a swordsman because I was constantly working with different people. I was working with Taekwondo guys. I was working with karate guys. I was working with Kung Fu guys. I was working with stunt coordinators. So, so you pick up a lot of stuff um, from those people as well as when you study uh, in a class situation. Mm. Now, we, we've, we've talked about, but certainly not talked to, on the show, folks who kind of had that that trial by fire, you know, on set, I guess, education is probably a better way to put it. You know, were you, I'm, I'm curious what it was like being exposed to all of these diverse skill sets. And I, I would imagine at a fairly high level, if they're involved in these projects that are, you know, getting aired, were you? Yeah, I mean, you, go ahead. You, you, when, you, when you do something like that, um, your work ethic 
you know, one of the one of the fundamentals of martial arts is respect and training. And the better you, the more you train, the better you get. Doesn't matter what talent you have, it's a known fact. I mean, they've done this these studies where you know somebody with talent uh, can not train and they can do something, but somebody that trains can get a lot better than the person with talent because it's a question of repetitive motion. When you're walking as a child, you walk along the street, you get to learn how to walk, and you get to learn how to run, and you get better and better at it, right? It's the same thing with martial arts. You get to learn those mo movements because your initial reaction to any situation is putting your hands up or flailing because that's your animalistic instinct. What martial arts teaches you is a, is a succinct way and a, and a structured way of how to deal with certain situations. So in my, in my situation, I was, I was put into all these different martial artists, all these different uh, things, and I just lacked it up. I loved it. I absolutely uh, adored uh, physical combat. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed the, the, the art form behind it. I enjoyed the philosophies behind it, uh, which you know, to me were as important uh, as you know, being able to kick or punch or block or throw or choke or any of those things uh, in the art itself. Mm. Yeah, it, it, it's certainly coming through. You know, your, your passion is coming through. And I'm curious, what would you identify yourself as, as a martial artist? If you, had to, <laughs> you know, if there was some kind of martial arts census and there were boxes to check. Uh... You know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I, I studied Kung Fu, I studied uh, Hungar Kung Fu, and I studied Shaolin Kung Fu, and I studied um, some Filipino stick fighting, and I studied sword, and I said, I, you know, to be honest, I, I just think, you know, you, you know the belt system, how, why, why the belt system was actually started. I'm actually working with a, a very, very good martial artist right now. Um, I would say teacher, martial artist, grandmaster. Uh, Mark Mikita from Phytology, uh, who's um, working with me on my um, Sword Experience Academy, um, which we'll talk about in a second. But, um, you know, the fact is, is that it, the belt system started because a teacher in Japan was trying to figure out when he taught somebody something, what he would have to reteach. So in other words, he'd walk into a gym and say, okay, who knows this for? And they go, well, I do, and I do, and I, well, he, Instead of doing that, all he had to do was give somebody a belt. He said, okay, I've taught you the first three forms. You guys get a yellow belt. I've taught you the next six forms. You guys get a red belt or whatever it was. And from that point, the belt system started. And I think that was a question of, of being able to uh, accomplish something and prove that you've accomplished it. Today, I find that the belt system is given away way too freely. I think, you know, you, they're not working for it. I mean, there's a lot of things we want to achieve in America. I think it's all about achievement and, and getting the, the prize, but not doing the hard work for it. And I see a lot of black belts and a lot of people that go in and say they're the black belt. And, and to be totally honest with you, I don't think they have the ability to call themselves a black belt. They've just gone through the process, but they haven't really studied enough to really excel at what that art is that they, they've studied. And I mean excel because you really have to, you know, in the old days, Getting a brown belt or a black belt or, or, or a first and second, you really had to work years for it, not you know, a year or two. And I think that's, to me, when you learn things, in my system, we don't have belts. We had certificates and stuff. I would learn. I've learned a lot of things. doesn't mean I'm great at one or doesn't mean I'm better than anybody else. It just means that I have a certain amount of knowledge and that's all I, the way I want to do it. I don't need to prove that, well, I've got, I have a belt. I just want to say that I have knowledge and I would like to share that knowledge with you if you want. If not, I'd love to find the knowledge that you have. To me, that's just a sharing of information between people. And this is a recurring theme. We've had quite a few guests on the show over the last few years who have brought up this very point, this idea that they've expressed it differently, but I'm going to express it this way, that maybe we've transcended belts. Maybe we've gotten to a point where their meaning is not as substantial as it once was. And should we be doing something different? And if you look at the way some of the more quote unquote modern martial arts are being taught, some of them, just as you said, have gone to certificates and other ways of representing that knowledge than a belt. Yeah. I mean, you know, belts had their, their time and I still think they do, but I just think they have to be, 
they have to be earned. <laughs> I think they have to be earned. You know, my, my son's in a martial art class. He's, he's very good. He's only six. He's very, you know, he's athletic. So he's going to look good when he does stuff because he knows how to move. So that's great. But, you know, he keeps getting a, gets one belt, gets another one, you know, three months later. Not, and I'm like, okay, you know, but that's for a kid to achieve. When you get to a point, there's got to be a point like, well, now I've got, I'm a black belt. And, and I look at some of the black belts and I'm like, okay, your, your motion is interesting. It's linear. It's not 360. You're putting a punch forward and you're not really showing it as a throw or you're not showing it as a block because there's several things you can do in one motion. And, you know, in reality, it's, it's, it's interesting to see that. And I, I constantly tell my son, remember, you've got to do this. And remember, you've got to do that. And remember this. Because, you know, I, I, it's so result-oriented that we want to be. And, and that's pr the problem of, of society today is we see everything online. We see everybody doing the kicks and how good they can be and how great they can be. And, and everybody says, well, I can do that. And, and the gratification and the result, I need to be able to punch 50 times really fast. Okay, well, but what's that going to do when you're on the floor and somebody's grapples you? <laughs> it doesn't work as well. So you've got to be rounded. You have to be, you know, have to really learn an art to understand what the whole physical thing about angulations, about distance, about, you know, uh, levels of uh, defense and attack. It's, it's, it's multi-leveled. And I just think sometimes we go into the, the, the fact of, of we want to have a belt or we want to have a recognition of being great, which is fine, but you've got to really work for it. It's my, my, my motto anyway. Mm. I think a lot of folks would be better served by the recognition coming from the hard work rather than what do I have to do to get the recognition? It, Let me it's, tell you it's almost like, like, you know, chasing smoke. Like you're not quite going to catch it that way. Right. Right. Exactly. I mean, to be honest with you, you know, if you're on the street and you've got a black belt, what are you going to say to somebody? I've got a black belt in Taekwondo or, or Hapkido or whatever. And the person's going, really? Bang. That solves it. Right? Or I'll take this stick. Defend against this. It, it, you're, not, you're not going to do that. You, you have to be smarter. I mean, you know, I, I tell something. I tell the story of uh, Miyamoto Musashi. Um, who I don't know if you know who he was. He was the one of the best um, mm -hmm. book of five ring swordsmen in Japan for centuries. Basically, they they named battleships after him. He bought the, he wrote the book of the, um, five rings. Uh, is it five rings or book of war? Yep. Book of five, five rings. rings. Five rings. Yeah. And um, Miyamoto basically, when he was fourteen, killed his first man, and he didn't know anything. He wasn't part of the 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 the, the uh, elite class. He was a commoner and he was going to be in trouble. And so he went into the woods for three years and trained on his own and trained and trained and trained and trained and trained and trained and, trained and then came down and challenged the two best guys in the village. Now, it wasn't a matter about how well he'd done that, that, that did it. It was about looking, at, his, looking at, at another level, and this is the other level of martial arts, is looking at your surroundings, at your, the, the environment that you're in, and knowing your opponent. And he knew that this opponent, the first one, would sit there before he fought him for literally an hour, meditating, seeing the fight, understanding where the fight was going to flow, how it was going to happen, etc. And he would envision butterflies and he'd envision all this stuff. And he knew that this uh, uh, man's brother was hot-headed. So Miyamoto, Miyamoto arranged to meet them. But he, what he did was he turned up four hours late to the meeting. And he did it on purpose because he wanted to unsettle the guy, which it did perfectly because this guy was no longer into the Zen I'm, I'm meditating mode. He was pissed because he was being disrespected. And by doing that, it unsettled him and Miyamoto beat him. And he knew that the brother was going to come at him angrily and he knew how to do that. And he size that and killed both of them. And he continued his career for 52 years, for 52 fights before he finally killed his last man with a wooden sword made out of an oar and never used a metal blade after that again. You don't think that man did it because he knew martial arts very well. He did it because he was smart, because he understood there's another level. That you can't teach somebody. You, you have to, it's, it's, it's something else that is another level up from being able to do, you know, five carters. And I've got a black belt, great. Okay, you've got a black belt, but that doesn't mean that this kid over here that's been on the street, you know, may be able to beat you because he's got something else that you haven't come across yet. Hmm. I'll agree that you can't teach it, but I wonder, can you 
facilitate it. What do you mean by that? Well, if you're if if you're using the example of the kid who's been on the street, those instincts and just kind of thought processes that we might think of someone who's spent a lot of time on the street might have likely came from them being on the street. Sure, there's probably a certain amount of innate ability that allowed them to survive, but a good deal of what they have came from that quote unquote practice. Correct. So Correct. could we create environments that would make it easier, isn't the right word, um, more constructive for people, for martial artists to develop some of these more advanced skills that are, as you're saying, you know, beyond kata, beyond practicing routine techniques? I think that's, that's being exposed to the world. You know, because I, I have people coming through my program and, you know, I have martial artists, I have stage combat people, I have different people coming through it. And a, a lot of the, the professionals say, oh, I'm really happy to be out here because this is not the dojo anymore. This is different grounds, different temperature. The weather's different. You know, I've got to, I've got to adjust what I know to be in this environment. And I think that's the other thing that you have to look at is what do you do? Can you punch somebody or kick somebody when you're up against the wall or somebody's pinned you up? No, you can't because that environment's, the environment's teaching you something. So therefore the environment of the gym is one thing, but being out in the open and being in this environment, in a different environment is something different. The kids on the street don't know. They might be able to know 15, 20 moves, but a martial artist knows 500. But what the kid on the street knows, he knows the environment. He knows that, you know, this box is going to be doing this. There's a, so a balance of the two is something, I think, you know, because you have the, the will to succeed and survive from somebody on the street and, and the technique from somebody in, in, a, in a dojo. So to marry the two is really where the better people come from, I think. Mm. I can see that. Now, you mentioned people that are coming through your program, and I, I do want to talk about what it is that you're, you're out in the world, as you said, teaching. But what, what is it like for you as you're working with these people who are used to being in the dojo that aren't used to being out here? You know, I'm, I'm using your words. Are they able to hang? Can they, or, or are, is it so foreign to them that? No, it's not, it's not foreign to them. Okay. They're, they're very, you know, um, I, you know, I learned a lot on Highland and I learned something very valuable uh, playing Duncan McLeod. And the re what I learned was that he was up against some people for 400 years plus. When he did that, he came up against guys that were using um, epées, using katanas, using broadswords, using every cutlass, losing absolutely everything. And he had to adapt his style or learn from that style to do that. And I think when you, when you come to a different format, you have to be able to adapt to that format or that style, keeping your own foundation because you have a foundation when you come to it. But you have to allow that format and learn from that so that you can have a, uh, what's the word, uh, a combination of the two. If you look at the style, if you like, that I had by the time I'd, I'd reached the sixth season, the fifth or sixth season, it was vastly different than the one at the very beginning. Um, the way I stood, the way I moved, the way I held the sword, everything, because it was a variety of things all mixed up together. And I think that's when people come to me. You know, I'll have karate guys that have never done, you know, sword before, and I find them very hard and rigid. Whereas the sword is a flow. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a movement. It's a. It, I hate the word flow in a sense because that's the end thing you want to do from one movement to another. But the really, the circular motion of a sword or the comes from the the, the fluidity that you have uh, in a sword. And I think uh, whether you're dealing as a as a uh, coming from a the Japanese, Korean, hard, uh, uh, katana style, or from the epe, very small, very quick movement style. There is a, there is a, a, a flow that has to happen in each. And, and you have to allow yourself to go into that flow and not just stay rigid within your own um, things that you've learned. This makes sense. It does. It does. Now, we typically save this for the end, but I think it's going to give us some, some more context, some more things that we can discuss. So talk about sword experience and, and the things that you were out teaching that, you know, seem to be pulling in some of these folks from 
you know, all different experiences looking to learn what you have to offer? Well, the Saudi Spin started, you know, it was funny because it started because a lot of people said to me, you should do a sword video, you should do this. And I said, well, to be honest, you know, I've, I, I'm not sure I'm qualified to do that. And the more it came, I said, well, the reason I want to call it a sword experience is why I wanted to give people the experience of being able to wield a sword, but also the fun of knowing, you know, uh, the, the movie industry as well, which I'm very well versed in after 30 years of being in this industry and doing martial arts for 25 years, over 30 years. And, and you know, uh, I wanted to bring some of that experience and that, that things I'd learned. And to show people it can be fun, but there's also a technique behind it. So my goal was to teach people initially the, um, the sword fights from various shows, which is what we do on our convention or our um, elite uh, events. Our conventions ones speak for them. Because we, I go to conventions for signings and we have uh, a, inside the hall, we, we go through a fight, we teach them the safety, we teach them the, the um the basics of, of sword play, and then we teach them the choreography, and then we, we film them, we photograph them, uh, and they get a whole package that goes with that. Our elite events tend to be into exotic locations like castles in Ireland and Scotland, and, and uh, we have just recently did a retreat in Belize. And um, we, we go to all these different places, and the same, same idea, but much more in depth, because it's a slightly longer package that we deal with. But in all that time when I do this, there's always something you learn as you, as you go ahead and do this. And I was partnered with people that martial artists or, or should I say sword, uh, uh, qualified sword instructors from different places that I visit. Um, and, you know, in, in working with them, I was said, if I am giving you the experience of what it's like to be in a sword uh, fight and you enjoy this, this process and you've had fun today doing this, um, uh, this experience in film, this instructor with me will be able to teach you further if, you could, uh, if, you, if you're in this city, if you, you want to continue learning. And so, you know, I've partnered with several different um, uh, sword um, experts or uh, professionals around the country uh, and actually around the world, really, um, to do this as well as now. And, and but doing, in doing that, I realize there's, a, there's always a, um, a theme that, keeps going through people always have the same issues they always have the same it could be the way they move the boken the way they move their feet and and there's always something so in doing this i realized that people will get a lot more out of it if they were able to work out on each individual thing separately so earlier this year or late last year we we started our, our academy events and our academy events are three separate types of events that you can choose which one you want to go to, even though each, all of them are succinct with each other. One is fitness. Uh, and, you know, I do a class now, which originally we started an hour and a half with a bunch of things, but now we're probably taking it to an hour. But it's really to do, to, to, to work your, your footwork, to work your, um, uh, the, the legs, the back, the arms, everything that you need. Because if you using a weapon of any nature, you need to have the stamina to do it. And so we created that format and we're still formulating that format as it, as it goes forward, um, based in a lot of different, um, uh, exercise of fitness regimes, uh, that come from either CrossFit or, um, uh, some foot, footwork and weight training and all these different things in the motion of using something that is non, um, it's it's a non uh what's the word um i think the word now uh not impactful it's uh, there's no force in the um in the in the it's not like picking up a weight yeah you, you you know this it's it's it, it flows but you're still getting a huge workout so that's one portion of the academy the second portion is technique that deals with uh now we have a uh 12 point uh, defense and attack system, which incorporates um, footwork, which is footwork, which is stepping or standing or, sh or, sh or shuffling, depending on what type of footwork you've got, as well as angulation, which is always a, a case that I find with people. When I ask them to do uh, a shoulder cut, some will come below the, to the waist or some will come to the head. I say, no, this is the specific place you need to use this cut, this number 
means you're going to this position. So these are all the defense and attack positions that we've created, which, of course, have a, a variety of uh, cutters that we can uh, come from that. And I found now that people are, are really liking that because it doesn't matter whether you are a total novice and you just want to do play and have fun with it, or you are, are somebody from HEMA or you're somebody that is a martial artist. Your targeting is ex extremely important because you've got to know where the, where the openings are. And if you are capable enough to be able to attack that opening, then you're specific with where you want to go and you'll be able to be a lot better at, at whatever you're doing rather than just swinging. And the third uh, um, uh, class that we, we hold in the academy is performance. Now, the performance one is taking a, uh, a, uh, a fight and using the, number, the numbering system and putting a fight together that you've seen uh, on, on film and explaining the, the stunt portions of it and how you, you deal with camera angles and the acting portion of it. So as a stunt person, as a, an actor, as a, anybody that's interested in doing that type of thing or, or stage play, you get to understand what you have to do physically as well as technically to put a performed fight together. So, it's, so we, this format is, is going through. We have one coming, a, a third one, probably we're going to be doing another one in, in Chicago at the end of uh, April. Uh, and then another one at the end of April uh, uh, in Los Angeles will be the first one in Los Angeles we're running uh, in, in LA for, for that particular um, uh, format. So, you know, to me, it's, it's, it's a, the technique is very important if, if you want to do something well. And so whether you're a martial artist or anything else, you really have to um, know what the basic techniques are and what the flow is. So there are hundreds of, adjustments that you can make uh when you do any sort of movement and you know everybody i find is an, another very simple thing people tend to do is they're always looking in front of them so if i'm doing a sword movement my sword movement is going to the front well in fact you should also be thinking to the side and behind you because there's danger all around when you're in a fight or in any whether you're in a battle or not danger is always all around you so that movement might be a parry, it might be a cut behind you, even though you're going forward with it, there are different things that you can look at as you do certain movements. I'm curious, you've mentioned that when people come into these trainings, they come in from you know, different martial arts disciplines. Sometimes they're, you know, they're coming from, from stunt work, from film. Are you able to know? You know can you tell who's who just based on the way they move with a, you know, with a bokken? Uh, I can tell immediately if somebody knows how to move with a sword. Immediately, I can tell. You know, it, it's it's like it, it's you've watched something. I mean, I've literally watched it thousands of times. <laughs> the movements, literally thousands of times. So you can tell when somebody moves, kind of what they might need or what they they're looking to achieve. I mean, I have a lot of people, a lot of people that come in. That are not martial artists. They are not swords people at all. They're just fans. They just want to come in and be part of that particular um, fight. Because, as I said, the convention and the the uh, elite events we have are all about um, you know learning the choreography of, of your famous of your favorite um, sword fight you might have seen on film. And we've done all. We've done loads. Of, I mean, we've done everybody. We've done uh, you know we've done so many different uh, TV and film fights that people sometimes come in for that. Um, so for a variety of reasons. So people come in from all walks, and that's what I, I think is it's okay to be uh, uh, different levels. I, I will pair people up based on their experience so that, you know, you can um, work with somebody that is on your level. Um, and sometimes it takes longer for other people to work on it, which is fine. Um, and I, I, I like to have the patience to do it because pe some people had patience with me when I was starting. So... Um, you know, I think it's important that everybody, but I can tell when somebody has done it or not, literally from, from the way they're moving. That said, you'd be really surprised by looking at somebody before they pick something up as to whether they're capable of doing it or not. Because I've seen people that are really muscular, very strong, and they can't move. And I've seen people that are really heavy, and they're moving gracefully across the floor. So you really can't tell before they actually pick it up whether they understand what the what they have in their hand. Mm, interesting. I would, I would imagine that 
there could be an element of unlearning that might need to happen. Are, are there people coming in with, you know, these deeply seated ideas of how they need to move and what they needed to need to do. Yes. And, and they're just like yeah. bricks and yeah. you got to, yeah. how do you yeah. work with that? There's always that. The only thing you can do is offer information. The information, it's like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't let it drink, make it drink. Sure. I know that's an old, old adage, but it's, it's like, okay, I'm giving you this information. You can do with it what you wish. You can fight me against it. And, and I'm not the only one in the room. I have two, sometimes, I mean, I've had 85 people in, in our corporate experiences that we've done before, 50, 50 people in our convention experience. So I have two or three instructors, other instructors with me. And when we tell you the same thing and you're going, no, but I think you should be doing this. Well, okay, fine. That's, that's your opinion. That's fine. We're just giving you the information and you can do with it what you wish. <laughs> it's nothing. I can't force you to do it. Right. Right. And, and just what you're saying right there, I'm sure we have quite a few people nodding along as they're listening, saying, <laughs> yes, you can only, you can only say it so many times before you just nod and smile and walk off to help someone who maybe wants to learn. You, you know, the interesting thing is when you teach, you learn, you learn so much when you teach. Um, Mark Mikita said that to my wife. He said, you should, uh, Adrian's learned a lot more than you think by just doing these, these, these things here because he's watching people and working with people. And, and I'll give you a, for instance, we were doing a, a choreography where I was, we had to do a pass between each other. You know, a lot in films these days, some of the stuff that you see, you wouldn't do in real life. I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to turn my back on somebody when I've got a sword in my hand just to do a spin, you know, unless there is a, a pass and something coming by that I need to get to their back. In reality, you don't do it. Well, we were doing this pass between two of us, and the pass was a, a reverse parry uh, that then came into a cut. Well, the person was not parrying in front of them. They were cutting across their head, and as they did that, they hit me in the head with it as we passed. And I went, whoa, okay, everybody. I didn't see that coming because I didn't expect somebody to do that because they were inexperienced and they didn't do the right motion. They did something different. So it allowed me to go, okay, if I'm doing that, I have to tell everybody else to be very careful of that as well. So you don't know what somebody's going to do when they're going through it. And it can be frustrating, but you know, you learn through seeing that some of the, the pitfalls in the choreography you're teaching or the, 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 the actual movements that, um, have been put in front of you or that you've been learning. I, I've heard a number of instructors say that the most dangerous people to train with are white belts and black belts. Sorry, say that again. They had, a, they had a what? Sorry. The most dangerous people to train with are white belts and black belts. <laughs> That's kind of it's what you true. illustrated there. No, it's, it's very true. Very true. Because, you know, you, you, I mean, obviously black belts know what they're doing and, you know, the one thing is always egos involved, uh, mm. you know, sometimes. And, you know, it's, you can't tell me I know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm okay, fine. That's all right. And, uh, but there are people, there is a humility that comes with every great instructor uh, or every great martial artist that they have the ability, but they don't necessarily have to prove it. Sure. Here on this show, you know, stories are kind of a, a deeply rooted tradition. It's one of the things that we try to do on, on every episode is tell a story or two. And I have no doubt that you have a tremendous number of stories from your time traveling around and, and being on screen. So if you might indulge me and tell me your favorite story. Uh, about what though? Because <laughs> well, <laughs> what do you want me to well, tell? Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's give it at least some loose hook to, or to, you know, martial arts or weapons or well let, let me answer it a different way imagine the audience that we have here and then a story that you think they may find either entertaining or exciting or sorrowful i mean how, however however you want to answer it uh i mean unless you want to talk about the broken weapons that that happen constantly on a set sure um you know, I mean, because the, the, one of the things, the difference between the weapons they use on sets today compared to the weapons uh, we used to use, and they still use some of them today. I mean, a lot of the time when you see people with any any type of weapon, it's not 
the real weapon they're doing because you need to be able to move it fast. You need to be able to do different things to be able to have the safety involved in, in using that weapon on, on set. So a steel uh, katana, for instance, would not necessarily be steel. It would be an aluminum blade. Usually when you're dealing with aluminum blades, which today are usually bamboo, in fact, sprayed silver on sets, um, the aluminum blades they used to use, we would have uh, the tang, which was the part of the metal part of the blade, it would run into the handle. Well, when we first started doing the, the, the fights in Highlander, uh, I can't tell you the numerous amount of times uh, the, the handle would break off in the middle of a fight mm. because the tang would only go halfway through the hilt. So you'd be ending up holding you know, half, a sword, half a sword handle fighting somebody. And if they didn't realize it, which happened to me when I was doing a fight on the uh, roof of the Paris Opera, um, so I can't remember what season it was, but um, and I'm fighting this guy who didn't have a lot of uh, experience, but had a lot of anger and too much wine before the fight. Um, he split my hand open, um, you know, my finger, which should have required stitches, but I didn't. But you know, because he hit me too hard and the handle broke off. Um, there's those instances, or uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper, uh, who um, you know was a very big boy, very good martial artist. Um, and I'm sure many of your listeners will remember who he was. If you don't, look him up. Um, Rowdy, Rowdy was doing a, uh, we were doing a fight, and I said to Bob Anderson, I said, this parry I'm getting here, I just feel the way he's swinging. He's, you know, I know when we get into the fight, the difference between training and actually performing it is the adrenaline that happens, <laughs> the ug factor, I call it. Like being in a, a golf, those people that play golf know that it's supposed to be the swing, not the force you put into it. Well, when R Rowdy was doing it, I knew we trained a little bit. And I knew he was very strong. And, and I'd said to Bob, I said, this parry feels we're, we're kind of weak. And Bob said, no, it'd be fine, it'd be fine. Well, right in the middle of the take, sure enough, he parries it, and it split, split the metal sword, not the tang, the metal, in half that went flying past my head and his head and landed clanging onto the ground. So sometimes there, there are uh, situations like that now. If you want a real funny story, when I was shooting Highlander Endgame and I was fighting Donnie Yen, um, Donnie, uh, you know, the stunt coordinator at the time or the fight choreographer at the time, we were doing, um, Donnie was going to be using a, um, a pole arm with a, with a blade on the end of it. And um, they fashioned it out of a, a, a lightweight um, aluminum, perhaps. And, my, and I had an aluminum a blade with the handle on it. But when Donnie got it, he said, no, can't use this. It's too heavy, way too heavy. So we have to make it. So we had to reconstruct it and we reconstructed his, um, I can't remember what material we used, but it, that meant his was going to be wood and painted so it could be moved. So we could move through the fight very quickly, which meant I couldn't use a metal sword. I'd have to use a, a wooden one, which then meant they're making wooden swords on the, on the set, <laughs> while we're shooting this, and sure enough, you know, when you have a pole arm, which has a lot more weight against it, and you're hitting a, a balsa wood sword, the thing would smash a lot of the time. So we would constantly be on set, you know, take one, bar, smash, break. Okay, take it again. It'll go from this point. So we would be constantly breaking these swords uh, on each other. Luckily, nobody got hurt, but, you know, it's... Uh, it's, it's something that you don't see as much today because they've actually gone to um, a lot of bamboo as being used now uh, in, uh, in fights rather than you know, regular wood, which could be heavy or split or splinter. Bamboo doesn't tend to do that, kind of shatters a little bit. It, it sort of just splinters off a little bit. It's, it's a much safer type of um, uh, material to use. Um, so today you'll find a lot of those. And actually I use bamboo uh, swords now for, for the bokens that we use in uh, the sword experience because I find they don't split in half with people hitting heavy. They're not likely to um, break off. They're more likely to just start, start splintering off and that way I can just replace them with no harm to anybody. What could you tell the audience that would be most surprising, um, most unexpected? about the way fight scenes are handled on film? You know, I think, I think people are really up to date with so many um, um, 
or so much information today that people have uh, about film film finding. Um, a lot of the stuff you see, you know, they're, they're, uh, hopefully most of the actors tend to do it themselves. That's one of the reasons I did the Academy was to allow actors to be able to uh, learn how to do that comfortably and go on a set and do it themselves so that they don't have to have the stunt double do it. Um, I would say that the, the most surprising thing really is the green screen effect and how camera techniques can fool you as well as the editing. I mean, if you really, if you look, I would say at 80% of the fights you see on TV and slow them down and then try doing the same type of motion within that fight, you will find it's impossible to do because they've cut it in a subtle way that the flow doesn't happen between the fight. The sound effects and the, the music and everything else cover the fact that there are mistakes happening all the time. I recently just did one from um, um, Game of Thrones, which is uh, Jamie Lannister against uh, Brienne of Tarth on the bridge. Mm. And when I looked at the fight, both myself and, the, uh, and uh, Keith Jennings uh, out of um, uh, Chicago, uh, we were looking at it, and, and there were moments in there, I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. He's, that parry doesn't make sense at all to go into this next cut. So you've got to look at what you're seeing on screen is really just, it's fooling you into thinking, you know, great sword fights happening. When it really works, and this is what Bob Anderson always used to tell me, you take the Errol Flynn's and that, they would shoot far off. So you could actually see the stunt performers, all the actors doing the fight from a ways, a ways away rather than cut, 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 cut. The minute that happens, it comes, it makes it exciting, but the reality of it is really cut in half. Do you have any role models? Anybody you look up to in the way that they've done choreography and, and fight scenes? You know, I mean, I, mean I, I respect Donnie Yen. I mean, I think he's, he's a um, very accomplished martial artist and he knows um, his, um, his fight um, uh, parameters on film as, as well. He's done amazing films. I, I really respect him uh, for that. I, um, there, there are, you know, there are a lot of people today uh, that are unsung heroes that you don't hear about um, who are fight masters or fight um, uh, behind the scenes that make the actors look good <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that I would respect um, that, I, you know, I, I don't know some of their names and, and yeah, I know the fights that they've done. Um, and uh, I think the, uh, I think anybody I respect is, is somebody that's gone through the, gone through the marches. You know, they've, they've done their time. They've done their, their, um, their, uh, their penance, I would put it, because they, they've suffered the cuts and bruises and know how to fall and know all these things. And I, I would say anybody that's done through that, I really respect because it's taken time to do it. And, and uh, through a lot of passion and a lot of pain, they've been able to achieve something. Mm. So, um, you know, people I don't respect are people that are disrespectful to other people because they're good at something. And I'm not going to name names on that because I don't want to, you know, Fair enough. cause a havoc. But, you know, certain people, I, I, they might be good martial artists, but I don't respect, I don't respect their, um, their philosophy. Right. Right. And certainly there are, I mean, one would be too many, but there are far too many of those. You know, we, we, we dabble in that conversation here on this show. Well, it's an issue. It's an issue yeah. because people believe that, now they've achieved something, they can treat somebody like dirt. And I don't believe that. I don't believe that gives you the right to do that. I just think, you know, you've achieved something through hard work, which is good on you. But, you know, to be able to be that disrespectful to somebody else who's learning or something else is just not. I mean, I know certain actors and certain uh, martial arts stunt people who hurt the stunt uh, actors because they can. And I just recently had that conversation. Uh, about with with some 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 people who said we were going up for these jobs and I knew this person was going to be doing it and I really didn't want to do the job because I knew that I was going to get hurt during it because they're just trying to make it it's not a question of making it look good it's a question of ego it's a question of like I can hurt this person and let me show them how far how hard I can throw them on film it doesn't matter on film I've been hit in the face on film and it doesn't look like anything unless you actually have the crossing the line the target the target area correctly and the 
and the reaction is big, then it looks like uh, you've been hit hard. But you don't need to hurt somebody um, to show that how good you are. In fact, it's smart of you to be able to be as much as in control as you can be to show how good you are. Makes sense. One final question before we start to wind down here. Do you have a favorite fight scene? Favorite fight scene? Um, are we talking swords or hands? Your choice. Oh, uh, well, I watched so many, uh, uh, so many sword fights. Uh, Maybe there's one that you look at and say, this is so beautifully constructed. Everyone just hits all of their marks perfectly and, and you can get into the head of the choreographer. Or... Well, I mean, getting into the head of the choreographer is one thing, but the performance of it is, is the other because, you know, really the, the, the uh, performers have to give the essence of that fight to, to, to the audience, you know. Um, sure. I, did, I did a fight, <clears throat> excuse me, I did a fight. I'm trying to think of it now. Uh, one of the best, I think, uh, Zatochi. Um, do you know the film? Uh, uh, it's um, uh, the film. I'm trying. To, it's the Blind Swordsman. Uh, I know of it. Um, yeah, it's. I, it's I haven't seen it myself. What it is, it's really interesting because it it, it deals in, in the essence of space. It's 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 been highlighted as one of the one of the best um, uh, uh, fights ever. Um, and you look at it and you go, okay, I, I get it, but why? You know, um, it's because it's so clean and so real. Um, the, the other fight that was um, uh, also, uh, oh gosh, I'm, I'm blanking on this right now. Uh, it's with Harvey Keitel, um, an old uh, fight. Right after he came off of Apocalypse Now, he went to do this, The Duelists, The Duelists. Okay. Yeah, the duelist. Now, why was the duelist so good? It was because it was so real. It felt real. It wasn't technically the best fight, but it was It was because in fights today, everything's really technically amazing. You know, it wasn't technically the best fight, but it was definitely a, a, a fight you were kind of going, okay, what, how does this, oh my gosh, oh, that happened then. And the little flicks and the little the nuances that they had in it, I, I, I enjoyed that fight because it was really basic. You know, um, I like the Star Wars fight uh, uh, that was um, from uh, I just and I just did it uh, uh, again. I just did it recently. Like you, I've had so many fights on my head uh, recently. That I believe I, that. I, yeah, I did out at, at the moment. Um, I just pull that up. I did, uh, I mean, 13 Assassins was another one that was actually a good fight. Mm. There are a lot of great fight scenes out there, I would imagine. And, and I'm sure that, you know, you're looking at them very differently than someone like I would look at them. You know, you're, you're seeing a lot of the effort that goes into it. I'm, I'm enjoying it and I'm imagining that there's effort there, but you actually understand all of that work that goes in. Well, it takes, it takes a lot of time to really, you know, put a, a fight together. Um, sure. You know, if you look at something called like Bushido Man, which was a very, te very um, uh, technically interesting, again, another blind swordsman, but it was uh, about moving between the distance. It, it dealt with a lot of distance and a lot of um, working off of your opponent. Yeah. Um, Bushido Man was a, you know, a very technical thing and then obviously you have things like braveheart which you know have you're just chopping people up like in game of thrones you can't find very many um fights that uh were uh one-on-one -on -one and had more than like two or three cuts to them because um, in reality that's what you're looking at you're trying to look at that type of thing um one of my favorite other fights that i saw was actually uh, die another day in bond hmm which uh, was one of the ones we actually did at my, one of my Chicago events. Um, Cause it was very, again, very theatrical, but you know, and, and some of it was very, um, didn't make sense in certain areas. <laughs> you kind of looked and go, ah. But the level of passion and power in it was, was, it was well filmed as well. So a um, couple of, couple of different uh, fights that I think had um, uh, things to look at. 
um, Jet Li's movie War was another one that had a, a good fight in it as well. Yes. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. Now, if people want to find, you know, stuff, we, we've talked about the sword experience and, and all the wonderful opportunities that are there for people if they want to get involved. How would they find that information? Uh, swordxp.com. Okay. And we're just revamping our site now and adding a few more uh, events this year. We're just finalizing one retreat in Germany, uh, which is a two day retreat. And we're probably going to have another one in, Se- uh, in Kirkland in Seattle um, at the end of September. Uh, we're looking at as well at the moment. But um, we're adding Panama, we're adding England, Ireland, you know, a bunch of places. But oh, cool. Florida, probably end of May. So, you know, <laughs> we, we're going through a revamp at the moment because uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it takes quite a lot to put on and depending on what, uh, what makes sense to travel and to, to get the people to those locations and who wants it. You know, we, we have people in Florida, Boston, Philadelphia, um, southern U.S. In, in, in Texas, which are very uh, rampant uh, fans of, of saw work there's a lot of interest in those areas that we found so you know we're, we're interested anywhere we'll go anywhere as long as we have interest and you know we can share some of our information to to the people hmm. great and one more thing i'd love to ask of you as we start to fade out here i appreciate your time today what parting words what advice would you give to the folks listening yeah, I think the quote I would like to sort of say is something I, I end at the uh, Sword Experience um, Academy events, and that is if you're not able to do great things today, continue to do small things in a great way, and great things will surely come. I think we find that time and again, martial arts is something that can be for everyone. It doesn't matter who they are, where they come from, or in this case, how they're using it. I've never used my martial arts skill in a film. I'm going to guess that most of you haven't either. But from what we've learned today, it doesn't seem like it changes too much. Martial arts is martial arts. Ego is ego. And what makes a good person and the way martial arts impacts that personal growth doesn't seem to change. So thank you, sir, for coming on today, telling us a bit of your story. If you want to check out the show notes, we've got some photos. We've definitely got links to everything we talked about today. Hit whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find all of that over there. Use the code podcast15 at whistlekick.com to save 15% on everything we've got going there. Social media, we are at whistlekick on Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. And of course, you can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. If you've got a guest suggestion, I haven't asked for that in a little while. There's a form over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Let us know. Who should we be talking to? Who do you want us to talk to? Maybe it's you. I would love to talk to you. So reach out. Let me know. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 